we came across these bright red splashes of blood on the snow. Just imagining being in that tent and having a hand, you know, six feet up in the air, shadowed against the tent, touching it. Probably the most terrifying thing I encountered. This is the Crypto Creatures Podcast. I am Brian, and with me as always is my co-host, Todd. What's going on, buddy? Hey, man. I'm just uh, getting ready for this show and uh, getting excited about talking to our guest tonight. How are you doing? I know. Sounds like a good one. I'm doing good, man. Doing good. I'm ready. <laughs> me too. Me too. We're bringing uh, Michelle on. She's written a couple books and owns a bookstore in Portland, Maine, and uh, yeah, um, going to talk about I'm, Bigfoot. Yep. I'm excited about that. I read her book. You read a little bit of her book. It's going to be good to talk to her and, and get pick her brain on uh, right. the whole writing process and the people she talked to and everything. Right, exactly. And she actually went to these people's houses and spoke to them one-on-one. So it's kind of cool how she put this together. So yeah, let's not waste any more time. Let's bring her on. Ready? Heck no, let's get her. All right, here we go. Hey, Michelle, how's it going? It's going great. How's it going with you? <laughs> good. We're good. Uh, thanks for good. coming on. Good. Yeah, we're excited you're here. Yeah, I'm excited to be talking to you guys finally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know. It's been a, we set this up a while ago, so I'm glad we finally got to connect. Right, right. <laughs> so for the audience, Michelle, um, you have a bookstore and have written a couple books, and you reside in Portland, Maine. Um, yeah, that's correct. One of your books is called Bigfoot in Maine, which I've read, and Brian has read as well. That's right. I got it sitting right here beside me, as a matter of fact. Right. He has a copy. Um mm-hmm. So uh, what made you start getting interested in uh, writing books and being an author and um, having a place there in in Portland, Maine? Oh, well, uh, the whole writing thing, um, I I started by doing the Strange Maine blog. And uh, one of the the earliest posts on it was actually me uh, discovering that there were actually historic Bigfoot accounts in Maine and, you know, asking people if they'd had any, any <laughs> encounters of their own. Um, uh, I didn't become a published author until uh, my publisher, History Press, discovered my blog and then asked me to write what became uh, Strange Maine True Tales from the Pine Tree State. And then about a decade later, <laughs> I finally finished Bigfoot in Maine and they published that too. Right. Were you interested in Bigfoot before you started doing this? Did, was there was there some kind of um, knowledge in your mind of what Bigfoot was, or did you, did you believe in Bigfoot at all? Um, I've always been curious about Bigfoot. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I would spend you know part of my time in the library looking through all the unexplained mysteries type books. Um, so I was definitely you know had read voraciously on UFOs and the Loch Ness monster and Bigfoot. But I didn't ever think that I would have any chance of encountering one or talking to people who had encountered a Bigfoot. Um, That's all been kind of a recent development that (laughs) my my 10-year-old self would have been very surprised about. Uh, Reading your book, the thing I liked about it is that you tried to make contact, personal contact with these individuals. I believe you did with most of them, um, which is really neat, just instead of calling on the phone and, and talking to them one-on-one like that. You actually made the effort to get out to their, their area and, 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 and talk to these people in person, right? Uh, yeah, I did when, whenever that was possible. And even when that wasn't possible, I tried to uh, personally visit the locations of their encounters so that I had a better sense of, of the area. And not everybody was all very excited to talk to you, though, right? Um, I definitely had a few people that I approached that I either never heard back from or they changed their minds about talking to me. They decided they didn't want to talk to anybody, even though they had originally kind of put up a flare and reached out. So, yeah. Yeah, we Hmm. get that too. We get people. Yeah, we get that a lot. 
that <laughs> say they'll come and talk and then they they kind of back up, which it's understandable. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't want to don't want to go through or relive these encounters honestly and, and talk about it right out loud. So yeah, it's it's yep. one of those life changing things, and you know, talking to somebody and going on record about it kind of opens you up to a whole other realm of issues and so yeah it's I, when somebody decides they don't want to talk i i totally understand so what was the uh neatest part about writing that book the bigfoot and main book that that you did what was what was the most fun about it for you uh well it was you know it was a great excuse to poke around in corners of maine i hadn't been to before uh, and didn't know much about but honestly it was i i was surprised by the end how many people had talked to me and how many different stories I heard. Uh, so like, I think it was th- just that alone <laughs> made it worth, you know, working all those years on the book was that when I first started the book, I didn't, I didn't expect to have like, you know, 20 plus people who would be willing to talk to me and answer my questions and tell me all about what happened to them. So that was, I would think that was probably the most exciting result uh, besides the fact that there were that many people who had had experiences um, in Maine, which is, you know, it's always a big question mark, you know, are they, are they really out there? Are people really encountering them? And uh, apparently in Maine, the answer is yes. Uh, When we started this, we had no idea Maine was such a big, uh, Bigfoot, area you know we had no idea how how densely forested that that state was we really didn't know much about maine actually and then we started talking to uh, a couple of people out there and started to research into it more and then we found you and it, uh, it's just crazy how how much it is out there yeah, yeah and you guys talked to uh mike vashon right yes we did yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause he, you know, he kind of comes up in it because he's, his uncle has been doing it for years. So, so that's a, he's got a whole history behind him <laughs> of unmistakable activity and encounters. Yeah. We talked to Michael. Um, we talked to Janelle too. I noticed that you had done a, uh, a little part on Janelle's, or actually a big part on Janelle's uh, story. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's um, her her family's stories are are epic, and that whole community that she's you know continuing to collect information from uh, is is just rife with activity even today. How did you come across getting in touch with these people, or how did you get get a list of the people that had had these encounters? Uh, well, I mean there there was no list originally. Um, I started out uh, putting out the word that. You know, I was looking for, for accounts like these, and I got a few people who talked to me about that. Um, and then a few a word of mouth. Um, I have a friend, Nomar Slavik, who does UFO investigations in Maine. And he started. He sent me, I think, two or three uh, of the people who are in the book. He referred them to me because um, I send him UFO folks <laughs> whenever I get the chance. And, uh, and then the rest were mostly me picking up on like just little comments people have posted online and uh, trying to track them down. Uh, Janelle, I didn't think I would ever actually get a hold of because she had posted on a chat board that's now defunct. Um, and the email address she had posted was old and defunct. And <laughs> so I, you know, tried a bunch of stuff to try to figure out how to get in touch with her, not even knowing her name at that point, just knowing like her usernames that she used. And, uh, and then, like, <laughs> joined the main Bigfoot Foundation group on uh, on Facebook, and she posted the article about her her father's encounter. And I realized this is the person that I've been trying to get in contact for like three years now. <laughs> so that was a really exciting moment, and and the fact that she was very willing to talk about everything was just kind of the the cherry on top. So. That was a great, that was a, that was kind of an adventure. <laughs> yeah, it was fun talking to her too. We, we really enjoyed that, um, that episode. Um, yeah. Yeah. Michael's, we called uh, Encounters in Maine actually was the title of that episode for, for Michael's episode too. And he had some really interesting things going on in his, his encounter. So, 
But, yeah. Uh, my family and I made a trip up to Maine um, a couple months ago, actually, and was checking it out. We actually were in Portland, and I apologize for not stopping by and checking out your store at the time. I had not read your book yet. Oh. But, uh, uh, I went I went hiking up there, and it's definitely um, very dense everywhere you go in the state of Maine, for sure. Um, it, it's kind of crazy how, how yeah. dense it really is. Yeah, as soon as you step off the trail and you try to do any bushwhacking, you realize. <laughs> and I think that was that was one of the big things about starting to investigate these encounters was to like go out there and learn some outdoorsmanship and get out there and learn how to orienteer through the woods and then to try to bushwhack through certain areas and realize how in some ways impenetrable that that screen of greenery that's all around you is but at the same time how it's not actually impenetrable if you can find a way to work your way through it like the game trails and stuff like that so that was really illuminating to to really to go out there and experience all of that repeatedly so what is your uh what's one of your favorite stories of the book that you wrote there which one which one stands out to you the most oh gosh um there <laughs> there's a lot of them that that stand out to me and i I kind of shift gears and sometimes I'm really excited about Mike Ledbury's encounter. Um, I mean, obviously Janelle stands out. Um, Susie who had all the childhood experiences um, is kind of an unforgettable one. Um, But one of my earlier interviews was uh, with the fellow who had, um, the tent encounter in his cousin's backyard up in Aroostook County. And, and that for some reason, just imagining being in that tent and having a hand, you know, six feet up in the air, shadowed against the tent, touching it as you're trying to not freak out and wake your cousin up. So he makes noise um, that there are moments where that's my favorite one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That definitely is a, <laughs> scary to think about because you know it's like is that a human playing a trick on me uh no it's too big to be human bears don't have hands like that oh, yeah. oh shit. Yeah. and and trying not to make any noise right. you know and and knowing that you know if your cousin wakes up he's going to make a noise and just you don't know what's going to happen at that point but yeah that's mm-hmm. the tension in that moment <laughs> So when you went to some of these locations, were you, um, did you sense anything? Did you, did you have any kind of reactions at any point or, or kind of interaction of, of anything or see anything? Um, I did not. Um, I definitely, I went out a couple of times with one of my friends who's a main guide, a registered main guide. And what I was surprised by would the fact that he could pick up on, you know, signs and sounds of the animals that had passed by us while we were there that I hadn't noticed. Um, like we, we were in an area that had a tremendous amount of deer, but we didn't see any of them, but the traces that they left and the little sounds that they made that he knew to pick up on were just there the whole time. (laughs) And I didn't, you know, I was, I thought I was listening sharply. I thought I was being really observant and I missed it all. So, 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 um, yeah, so I didn't, I unfortunately didn't encounter anything like that. Um, probably the most terrifying thing I encountered was, um, out in the woods down in York County, uh, in the winter, uh, we were going through an area that had, uh, tall pines overhead, but then kind of open at the ground level. You could see a fair distance between the trees. Um, and we came across these bright red flashes of blood on the snow that was in patches under the trees. And uh, wow. then her really loud crashing noise, probably about 100 feet away in the underbrush where we couldn't see <laughs> Um, and then hightailing it out of there, um, figuring it was probably really late to steer wedding or something like that. Um, like we had obviously interrupted something. Uh, yeah. so, um, we, we decided prudence was the best, uh, course of action because 
whatever it was sounded really large and uh and with the amount of blood that we saw we didn't want to we didn't run it want to run into a wounded animal and uh see what would happen next so we hightailed it out of there pretty quick so the Durham gorilla, I, I see that um, listing there in, in your book, and I don't quite remember that story, but why don't you tell us about that? I'm, I'm interested in that story for, for the title. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, the Durham gorilla is probably Maine's most famous uh, Bigfoot story, and it happened you know, in kind of high Bigfoot season in uh, 1973 in, uh, along the town line between uh, the two towns of Durham and, Gor- uh, Durham and Brunswick. Uh, a a group of kids was out biking summer vacation, uh, for, like early uh, late June, early oh wait, like late July. And at any rate, they were out biking. Um, there wasn't much else to do out there, so that was they spent a lot of their time just biking around on these long curving country roads under the trees. And uh, uh, Tamara had gotten ahead of the other kids uh, because her friend that she was, you know, having a sleepover and everything with uh, had her two younger, younger brothers with her. And they, of course, smaller bikes, smaller legs, not as fast. And so she had to hang back with them while Tamara had gotten way ahead of them, uh, probably about a quarter mile uh, from the way I figured it from the looking at it on the map and uh, she could still hear them in the distance, but she couldn't see them anymore because of the curve in the road. So she stopped at the top of this little hill and uh, looked uh, into the forest as she was standing there waiting, killing time. And there was something looking back at her, Uh, something about her height uh, covered in dark hair uh, with these, uh, green eyes that seem to almost glow in the dimness of the, of the can of under the tree canopy. Um, and so she and this creature just stared at each other, uh, just, you know, astonished. I think both of the, she, the impression she got was that they were both astonished at what they were seeing and very curious. Um, she thought it was probably the creature was probably about her age uh, she kind of just got that impression from it that it was a juvenile like she was. Uh, and they just stood there staring at each other probably for less than five minutes, I, I would have guessed. And she had totally forgotten that the other kids were coming up behind her, which they eventually did. And her friend Lois saw what she was looking at and shrieked, toppled off her bike there was a whole brouhaha, and of course the creature was immediately pivoted and took off into the woods, uh, disappeared, and uh, there was just, at that point on, basically mayhem. Um, Tamara and Lois and the two younger boys went back to Lois's parents' house to, you know, patch up her knee because she had skinned it when she fell off her bike, and uh, her parents called law enforcement in the area. And the word got out, and by the end of it, uh, dozens of law enforcement personnel and their vehicles had gotten involved. Uh, A local radio station had announced uh, that there was a large mystery creature in the woods that was potentially dangerous, and the public just kind of went bonkers. Um, You know, it's like something something out of a, a bee monster movie where, you know, all the guys show up in their trucks with their guns and the beer and, and they try to go find the monster in the woods. Uh, they had to basically uh, post patrols to keep uh, civilians out of the woods because they didn't want <laughs> that kind of mayhem going on in there. Um, and uh, for a few days, uh, that whole area was just in an uproar. There were helicopters involved just a continual flow of law enforcement vehicles searching the area. And, and then of course, private citizens like Lois's mother also organizing their own searches because she apparently also encountered the creature as well. 
Yeah, I was going to say, wasn't happen. there several? Wasn't there several encounters during the mid to late seventies in Maine and around that area? The, the same kind of thing going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, uh, just a few years later, uh, and about a couple, just a couple of miles away, uh, Mike Ledbury had his uh, repeated encounters with a family group, uh, which lived in the woods around where he lived with his family. So yeah, so it's. And he kind of vaguely knew that something had gone on a few years before, uh, but they were um, they had just moved into the area recently, and so he wasn't as aware of it as probably people who lived there during that event. Um, so yeah, and he just kind of tackled it in his own way, and <laughs> actually probably not too different than how Tamara would have investigated it if she had had the chance without all the brouhaha going on. Mm-hmm. So he took a very uh, like National Geographic approach to it, and uh, you know, having read about Diane Fossey and and Jane Goodall and and everybody who was trying to work with primates, he kind of tried to adopt some of their methods and uh, had some interesting results. Gotcha, cool. So, what was the other book that you've written? Is it about uh, Bigfoot or? Uh, it is. Uh, it's called Strange Maine. Uh, True Tales from the Pine Tree State, and that's all. It's kind of a smorgasbord of odd main stuff. Uh, there is actually a chapter in it which deals specifically with weird creatures in the wood, and there is uh, part of the chapter is actually kind of the seeds of what became Bigfoot and Maine later. Uh, so I wrote about, uh, you know, how Maine, there was a scientist in Maine who was breeding unicorns at one point in the 30s, and, <laughs> you know, the specter moves and other fun things like that. So yeah, well, there's a good variety it. in there. Yeah. <laughs> you got to figure somebody's going to try it, right? Why not? I'll make yeah. a unicorn. Let's see what happens. Yeah, yeah. why not? And do Give it, it as, as part of the university of Maine's uh, laboratory system. So it was, you know, done at a biological lab station that was official and, and everything was on record. So <laughs> it's, it was pretty well documented. Wow. Okay. So you own the green hand bookshop. What, what kind of books are we going to find there? If we, if we stop in there and um, look around all kinds of <laughs> different kind of uh, cryptid related books or more than that or what? Oh, uh, well I have a little bit of everything. Um, pretty heavy on the genre stuff like sci-fi and horror uh, and mystery, but I definitely do have a have a decent cryptozoology section, plenty of esoteric stuff, uh, lots of UFO and ghost books too. Um, when I first opened the bookshop, I uh, at the same time Lauren Coleman opened his International Cryptozoology Museum in its first public presence, uh, and he sublet my back room from me, so we shared space for the first few years. And uh, oh, yeah. yeah, so I actually had his big uh, Crookston Bigfoot uh, carving uh, figure uh, up in the front of my bookshop for the first few years that I was open. So there, there was wow. plenty of Bigfoot no, in there. Cool. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we stopped by and checked that out when we were there. Um, is he is he building oh, a new good. building now? I heard maybe so he's he's relocating in, in, to a new place or something. Um, I know that uh, later later this summer he did um, double the space he was in and moved into the space that was next to it as well. Okay, but gotcha. I'm I'm sure he would love to have his own building. Um, but I'm not. I don't know what his uh, <laughs> if he has anything set in stone yet. Right. So you got into this this old Bigfoot thing um, through writing and and everything. Are you heavily involved in it now? Do you go out? searching, uh, looking for Bigfoot out in the woods there in Maine? Um, I would love to be doing that. Unfortunately, the last year and a half has been really rocky as a small business owner. <laughs> so yeah. I mm-hmm. have been slave, slave to the book minds um, and uh, have been doing that uh, predominantly. So, But I'm hoping in October when things, when things kind of slow down and hopefully – regulate themselves a little bit better um, that I'll be going out and doing my first excursion again uh, since all this nonsense happened. I think the last uh, the last hike I went on to go look at stuff was in, I think, 
February, right before COVID hit. So it's been a long wait to uh, to get my feet back out on on the ground out there. <laughs> so, right. so I'm hoping that all starts up again soon. But I had to survival survival came first. So sadly, <laughs> no, we understand oh, totally. yeah, for sure. So, what's your thoughts on Bigfoot? Michelle, what do you think Bigfoot is? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I've talked to a lot of people with different opinions of their own. Um, and, you know, looked and listened to as many different case studies as I could. I have to, you know, obviously they're a primate, as we are. Um, they seem to have certain humanistic qualities to them that other primates do not. Um, And, you know, I've heard people talk about whether they're, you know, like just a different race of humans, uh, which, you know, obviously could explain some of the issues with differentiating DNA. Um, If they are very close relatives, that would make things really complicated um, when you're trying to parse data out. Um, but I know that, you know, they're obviously their pursuits and their focuses are not those of, you know, modern homo sapiens. Um, I, in, uh, Susie's account at the beginning of the book, she, at one point tried to, um, teach them the family that she spent time with. She tried to teach, uh, the older male, the father, uh, how to play cards and he just, it wasn't. He was not interested, but at the same time, he understood that she, as a kid, liked playing with toys. And so if he found like an abandoned Tonka truck out in the woods, he would bring it to her because he knew that she would enjoy it. So, so there's, there's some interesting questions about how similar and how different they are to us. Um, And it seems like they're definitely closer in nature than a lot of other primates. So there's, I think uh, right. one of the reasons people kind of push and pull so much with the existence of Bigfoot is because, um, you know, if and when we prove their existence, th- there are going to be a lot of big questions and a lot of, <laughs> you know, philosophical oh, yeah. uh upheaval that's going to happen and it's, it's going to be tough for people to deal with. Um, yeah. And I think that's at the heart of a lot of the controversy is because everybody knows this is, this is a big deal, whatever it is. Yeah, I agree. So on that note, then why do you think Bigfoot hasn't been proven that he, that it is, is, uh, existence? That is something that I, like many others have, you know, really struggled with. Uh, I mean, given they're very elusive, they're very skilled at avoiding human contact. Um, presumably, we they are leaving DNA evidence behind, which also supposedly we've been collecting. But every time it comes down to analysis, nothing definitive has been gleaned from that. So I don't, I don't know. Um, It's either, you know, really poor collection of evidence or poor data to compare it to to identify it or things get fumbled on purpose. I don't know. (laughs) It's like, it's one of those circular logic things where you just, go in circles and there's no good answer. Um, and so all you can do is, you know, like the folks that at the main Bigfoot foundation keep trying to do is like figure out like, how can we get samples and how can we keep them uncompromised and get them analyzed legitimately and, you know, try to take those steps. And, uh, there's a lot that's tied up in that. Um, and especially since the majority of the people who are trying to pursue that don't have scientific training, they're just trying to do the best they can based right. on common sense and what they are working with for equipment. So 
So I don't know. <laughs> I think it's encouraging that people like uh, Dr. Todd Disatel is, you know, working on the forefront of the eDNA uh, analyzing and is pushing stuff forward in a legitimate direction. Um, and I think that's really encouraging. And, you know, hopefully, and um, but Dr. Jeff Meldrum is also looking at it also from, you know, not only those viewpoints, but also from like a broader anthropological viewpoint and trying to kind of push the anthropological institution into right. looking at things beyond a linear uh, evolution. And so it's, it's encouraging that there are small pushes for change happening within the scientific community alongside a lot of activity in the amateur community. Um, it would be really nice if there was more cooperation and more organization of all of that uh, to uh, reach a conclusion. Right. Right. Well, I think you're talking about the DNA and all that. I, here's what I think. I think that somewhere along the line, um, whatever species uh, we came from split, one went to a gorilla form and one went to a human form. And somewhere in the middle of there, you've got another species that kind of stayed in between both of those things. And I think that's what Bigfoot Sasquatch is. People describe, describe them as being human looking a lot more times than not. I think they're your basic, yeah. what, what you call, what people were told were cavemen back in the day. That's what Bigfoot yeah. is, is a caveman. And the reason that you can't, first of all, they have nothing to compare the DNA to because they don't have anything. Or they don't know that they have something. Yeah. Second, it's going to show human human trait in it. So they're automatically going to say, well, it's it's been um, compromised with human DNA. So it's no good. So yeah. it's either one of the two things are, are, are there. And, um, you know, so no one's ever going to say, well, yeah, it's Bigfoot DNA. Well, how do you know? You have nothing to compare it to. All you can say is it's unknown. Uh, and if you get that more so than the human part, um, you're onto something. But still, I, I believe these things do have some human part to them. And because yeah. of that, you're always going to get that that human kind of DNA. W what are we compared to chimpanzees or gorillas? 99 point cent, uh, percent, 98 point cent, uh, percent close? Is that, is that what yeah, we are? Yeah, something like that. Um, so we could be 99.5 percent close to, to these things, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have a feeling they're very close relatives, and that's creating some of the difficulty in differentiating that we're seeing. So it'll be interesting to see if they can build. I know that there are some, I think uh, like the Olympic group and a few others that are trying to do really hardcore analysis and collecting samples. It would be nice right. to see eventually if a database is built up well enough that we have a comparison point just from all the combined data that allows them to start saying, well, wait a minute, all this stuff that was inconclusive all matches itself. So maybe within that, they can build up um, at least a, a prototype of what the, the DNA chain that we're looking for is. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Right. Yeah, it will, for sure. Yeah. So I have a theory, or I have a question uh, about Maine and Bigfoot for you, Michelle. I go a lot on the BFRO uh, website, which talks about, you know, when people report their encounters to the BFRO, they, they, they pinpoint it, show it on the map and whatnot. And, and surprisingly, Maine doesn't have a lot of them, as many as I expected them to have. So my question is, do you think, <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's just because there's really not a lot of Bigfoot in Maine? Or do you think that so many people are seeing them, they just don't report them anymore? Or they're just like, well, yeah, I saw a Bigfoot, whatever. I mean, is it that do you think it's the, the population could be that dense up there? Well, I think it's pretty complicated. Uh, I think that it's not because there aren't encounters and sightings here. That is clearly, it's the BFRO totals that they post on their site are not reflective of the activity in Maine. Um, and I think that for multiple reasons, um, there are reports, a lot of reports, um, especially since Finding Bigfoot started airing. I don't know if you've ever looked at the difference between uh, the number, the sequential numbering on their reports from before Finding Bigfoot came out compared to now. They received tens of thousands of reports 
<laughs> once Finding Bigfoot started airing. And so there's a lot of stuff that hasn't been processed and is not publicly listed on the site okay. that has been okay. reported to them. That's what I thought. I just wanted to confirm. Yeah. <laughs> And the other complication is that there are people like Janelle and other people that I talked to who did report it to the BFRO and either never heard anything back or found the response to be either dismissive or distracted or, you know, not what they were looking for at all. Um, And I think word kind of spread that the BFRO was not necessarily to be trusted with this kind of information. Um, And especially when they started doing paid expeditions in Maine, which were predominantly out of state people coming in and paying the BFRO to camp with them on these expeditions. I think that soured Mm. the pot a little further. Yeah. Um, (laughs) So, and Mainers tend to keep things to themselves anyways. And so that it's, I think it's a combination of a lot of factors. But I can guarantee you. Yeah, and I'm not promoting. <laughs> I'm not promoting BFRO at all. I just, I, it's just uh, one of the sites you can use to go look and see activity. But I knew when I saw that, I'm like this, this, yeah. this has to be where people just off, aren't reporting off, it. Yeah. They're not reporting it. Yeah. Um, and they do, like, it. they do have some really good people who are who are volunteering with them as regional reps. But you know, not everybody is great. Um, I know they have one guy who. Um, who is doesn't live in Maine but handles some of the Maine reports and he's great, um, but he's not. He hasn't been there forever, and his predecessors, I think, probably set a bad, or some of his predecessors set a bad, uh, a low bar. <laughs> right. So, right. so there are right. there are really dedicated people that work with BFRO, but you know they're individuals working within a very large group of people. So right. it's. Uh, yeah, it's difficult to generalize, but I can definitely tell you that the number of main reports on the BFRO site is not the actual number of encounters and sightings, for right. sure. I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, I believe it. So, um, do you think it's going to take a body to prove Bigfoot exists? And are you, are you, are you? I don't want to put you on a spot, but do you think it's right to to kill one to to make that happen? Um, I think a body would certainly tie the knot. Um, I am not, I am of the no kill, uh, camp, (laughs) I guess you could call it. Uh, I'm not, that's not my goal and I'm not going to generally associate with people who that's their prime goal. Um, that's a very different faction, I think. Um, but I also understand that the body is paramount. You need uh, a hologram. You need the holotype, uh, the one specimen that allows you to draw all the samples you need and, you know, compare all the tissues and, you know, all of that. Um, and I've talked to, there's a, there's another main Bigfoot investigator who's actually written a Sasquatch Hunters Field Guide. And even when I talked to him, because he, t- he, you know, the whole thing is we need a body. And when I talked to him, I was like, do you think you could actually shoot one if you had the chance? And he's like, mm, I don't know. I'd, I'd really much rather find a carcass somewhere <laughs> and be able to recover the carcass than be put in a position where I might have that to happens. shoot one because I don't know if I could do it. Right. Wouldn't we so. all? Wouldn't we all, right? <laughs> well, I've got one more question for you before we wrap this up. Um, do you believe there's any paranormal alien um, attachment to Bigfoot? going on? That's a good question. Um, I know there are lots of reports that kind of parallel and align themselves with UFO activity. Um, I mean, that's undeniable and it would be foolish to say that doesn't happen. Um, But I have not encountered anything or talked to people who have been able to illuminate anything for me that would actually directly tie them together. Um, I mean, it could just be something as vague as there are certain times and places where activity is high just in general in all sorts of weird ways, like those sort of window areas where just for whatever reason, 
there are coinciding forces at work that everybody pays attention to and then they see everything. Um, but beyond that, I could not say for sure. I, I would say that I'm not going to dismiss that because there's obviously reports that tie the two together. Um, but my basic pursuit of the idea of Bigfoot is an earthbound biological mammal um, that lives alongside of us. Mm-hmm. And any exceptional abilities it might have, I mean, the infrasound makes sense. There are other animals that have infrasound capabilities already. Um, things like that. Um, that all makes sense in that context. Um, but things like, I know people surmise there might be teleportation involved and other stuff like that. I have no idea. That's, not, <laughs> that's, that's outside of my <laughs> bailiwick. Right. But right. it's definitely interesting. Neither so do we. I'll, I'll tell you that. It's definitely interesting. Neither do it we. It is, for sure. And nobody knows. Nobody knows really what these things are, you know. And nobody, we may never know what these things are. Yeah. Uh, And I think one of the things that gets overlooked is that there is, you know, obviously there are going to be differences in them. They're not all going to be the same. Um, And I've talked to people who have encountered um, ones that are different than the standard, Um, you know, the, the dark hair, the, you know, generally curious but not too threatening demeanor like that kind of thing and then one and Mm -hmm. that same person who encountered stuff that was of a much more violent and aggressive nature very different coloration very different behavior um Mm -hmm. so i would say that you know as within any species there are going to be different types emerging um and i think that's something that gets overlooked a lot it's not just one Bigfoot, it's multiple. And then within those multiples, there are other delineations that occur too, uh, whether because right. of climate or breeding or whatever else. I think we're going to be looking at a variety <laughs> in the end. It's not just going to be oh, one yeah. type. It's going to be multiples. So, Kind of like people, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they have their own personalities. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we thank yep. you for coming on, Michelle. It was awesome talking to you. Uh, we appreciate yeah, it was. we appreciate it so much. Yeah, I was re- it's been really great. I'm glad we finally got to get to chat. Us too. Us yeah, too. me too. And it was if- fun. Um, <laughs> we're definitely gonna get that that link out there so people can can uh, get your book. Awesome! Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm gonna check out uh, the other book, Strange Maine. What was the whole title there? Strange Maine. What? Strange Maine, True Tales from the Pine Tree State. Gotcha. I definitely want to check that one out, too. <laughs> yeah, I want to check that one out, too. And if I'm in Maine again, if we're in Maine again, we'll we'll stop by your store and see what else you got there. So, And listeners yeah, as well. that would be awesome. Hopefully the listeners will check it out if they're in Maine and uh, and see what you got got there and say hello. So, Yeah, Woo-hoo. for sure. All right, Michelle, you have a good night. You take care. We appreciate it again. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. You guys do, too. I'll uh, look forward to listening to more of your episodes too. We appreciate it. Thank you. We appreciate that. (laughs) All right. Bye guys. I'm glad we finally got Michelle on and, uh, talk to her about all this cool stuff, man. Me too. That was fun. Yeah. 10 years to write that book. I don't know if we have 10 years. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Well, you know, we kind of stuff it all in as much as we can, but Hey, that's you know, right. That's what's cool. Yeah. But it went in, it was a good book and she was fun to talk to. So I'm glad we got her on finally. Yeah. She had some interesting uh, concepts and, and some stories and um, I'm really glad we brought her on for sure. So yeah. if you guys are out in Portland, Maine, make sure you check out Michelle's store and uh, check out her books mm-hmm. and uh, Bigfoot in Maine is, is one of her books. So be sure to check that out. And yeah. thanks again to all the listeners. Uh, if you guys have had an encounter and you want to come on the show, email us at info at cryptidcreatures.co. You can get us on Twitter. Yep. You can get us on Instagram. Yep. Reach out to us. Get a hold of us, guys. We look forward to hearing from you. So thanks again. We appreciate it. Always. Brian, until next time, take care, yep. man. See ya. <laughs>